Thanks for the introduction, Brendan, and uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk here. So, uh, like you said, I'll, I'm going to talk about homomorphisms of strongly regular graphs, uh, about a result I proved uh, uh, earlier this year, um, sort of characterizing all the possible homomorphisms, uh, all the possible endomorphisms of a strongly regular graph. Uh, and just so we all know what we're dealing with, uh, I'll go over the definition of a homomorphism. So, uh, our graph homomorphism is just some map. Uh, from the vertex set of one graph to the vertex set of another that preserves adjacency. So that means that uh, if u and v are adjacent, which I denote with this tilde, then phi of u and phi of v should be adjacent. Okay? Okay, whenever there exists a homomorphism from some graph g to h, we write this little uh, arrow notation. And then sort of as the usual notation goes, a homomorphism from an object to itself is an endomorphism. Okay, so here's an example. Um, this is a seven cycle, uh, but I've drawn it in such a way that you can sort of see how you can map it to this five cycle by a homomorphism. I'm mapping these two blue vertices to this blue vertex, these two red vertices to this red vertex, and then the green to green I guess this is like magenta to magenta, yellow to yellow, okay? And it's pretty clear that this preserves the agency. All the edges sort of go in between the, the images, right? Uh, and then similarly, you could do this for any odd cycle. I could take C2K plus one and sort of fold up three edges and get to C2K minus one. And of course, it's easy to see that these homomorphisms, they, they compose. So not only can I go from like sort of C2K plus 1 to C2K minus 1, I can actually go to any smaller uh, odd cycle, all the way down to C3, which is the triangle. Okay, another special example of a homomorphism is a coloring, which maybe some of you have heard of. Uh, and in coloring is just an assignment of in colors to the vertices of my graph so that adjacent vertices get different colors. Okay? So these, this has got blue and red and red and yellow and all this. Okay, but this is actually, it's the same, it's the same thing as a homomorphism to a complete graph. Because if I'm mapping to a complete graph, I want to map adjacent things to adjacent things in my complete graph, but in the complete graph, adjacent just means different. So, okay, and here's, here's sort of an, il an illustration. I've taken the Peterson graph, right, and I've mapped it uh, to this triangle, sort of just according to the colors and sort of, here, this is the same graph, but I've just sort of mixed it all up into the color classes. Okay? Um, so for the purpose of this talk, uh, any time I have a homomorphism uh, whose image is a complete graph, so uh, just, the, sort of just the vertices that uh, are in the image of the function phi, if they induce a complete graph, then I'm going to call phi a coloring. So maybe I have... I've mapped this to a triangle, but maybe I mapped it to a triangle in some, some bigger graph. I'm still going to call it a coloring, and that's just to make it easier to state the results. Okay, another nice thing about uh, graph homomorphisms is that it sort of it unifies a lot of graph parameters. You can, you can define a lot of common graph parameters in terms of homomorphisms. Okay, so the example we just saw basically is that you can write the chromatic number in terms of homomorphisms to complete graphs. So our coloring is just a homomorphism to Kn. So then the chromatic number, that's just the minimum number of colors you can color your graph with. We denote it chi of G. And this is just the smallest complete graph you can map your graph to. Okay, and then the clique number, so clique number, this is the maximum size of a set of pairwise adjacent vertices in your graph. And of course, this is the same as the, the maximum size of a complete graph that gets mapped into your graph. Okay. And there are lots of other examples. So you can take, say, fractional chromatic number or circular chromatic number or vector chromatic number. Lots of these things can be written in terms of, of homomorphisms. For instance, fractional chromatic number it can be written in terms of homomorphisms to kinesiographs. Of course, uh, not all of those are as sort of trivial to see as, as these two examples, but you can do it. Okay, and then there's this, there's this notion of monotonicity that goes along with, uh, with these parameters. 
if I have a homomorphism from G to H, well, then it's not too hard to see that the chromatic number of G is at most the chromatic number of H, because if I can map, if I can map H to some complete graph, right, then I can map G to H and then compose that with the map to the complete graph. So I can always map G, if I can map G to H, I can map G to any complete graph that H can get mapped to. Right? So I get this notion of monotonicity. So this is, this is true for chromatic number, but of course it would also be true for clique number and fractional chromatic number and all these other things. Okay, so this is just the argument I just showed you. Right? So if I have a, and this, of course this goes for, for any, any graph K, not just complete graphs. Okay, so another important uh, notion in the study of graph homomorphisms is this notion of homomorphic equivalence. So this, we say the two graphs are homomorphically equivalent if there's just a homomorphism in both directions between the two graphs. So if I can map G to H and H to G, then we say they're homomorphically equivalent. Alright, um, so if I have two graphs in the homomorphic equivalent, then well, the chromatic number should be the same, right? Because I have a homomorphism from G to H, and that means I have chi of G less than or equal to chi of H, but then I also have the other direction, right? I have H to G, and so I have the inequality the other way. Right? And then same for clique number. Okay, so in some sense this is saying that sort of G and H have the same homomorphic information, and that's sort of a vague, a vague, a, a vague sounding statement, um, but it just means that sort of in terms of existence of homomorphisms, it doesn't matter whether you're considering G or H. Uh, now, if you want to count the number of homomorphisms, then, then things are different. They're not necessarily going to be, have the same number of homomorphisms from one graph to another. But in terms of the existence, it's the same. Can you show some non trivial example where to a non homomorphism? Yeah, yeah, we'll see an example where they're homomorphic equivalent in a little bit. Yeah. And please feel free to ask questions. If there's anything that you don't understand or you want to know something more about, please just stop me and ask. Okay, um, so a core is just a graph that has the property that any homomorphism from the graph to itself is a bijection. So this is sort of what the main result of this talk is about. It's about the cores of graphs. And Another way of uh, defining a core is just to say that uh, yeah, it doesn't, your graph doesn't admit any homomorphism to a proper subgraph. So a proper subgraph just means a subgraph that is not the entire graph. Okay? So if, if, every, if every homomorphism from the graph to itself is a bijection, that just means I can't map it to a strictly smaller subgraph. Okay? And uh, we're going to see how this relates to this notion of homomorphic equivalence uh, in just a few slides. Okay, so here's some examples. So a complete graph, this is a core, right? Because all of my vertices are adjacent. So there's no way I can map any two vertices to the same vertex. Uh, another example is an, are, are odd cycles. So any proper subgraph of an odd cycle is just a path or maybe a disjoint union of paths. And then that uh, path is bipartite, so it means it's two colorable. But of course, an odd cycle, you need three, co three colors to color. So uh, there's no way I can map an odd cycle to something that's two colorable. And actually, it's known that almost all graphs are coarse. Uh, so this means that if you sort of pick one at random, uh, then as the number of vertices you're, you're picking your graph on gets bigger, the probability that you get a core goes to one. And because of this, uh, it's sort of, it's not particularly inter interesting to just sort of find an example of a core. It's not, it's not exactly rare. I mean, almost all of graphs are cores. Uh, so when you're studying cores, usually what you want to do is you want to sort of look at some highly structured class of graphs or a highly transitive or highly regular graph and then try to determine whether these graphs are cores or what their cores look like. Okay, so the core of a graph, so we're going to sort of slightly overload the terminology here. So a graph H is the core of another graph G if H is a core in the sense of the previous slide and G and H are homomorphically equivalent. Okay? So this is sort of how these, these two things relate. 
But you can also, this is, this is easy to show, but sort of non-trivial. You can show that the core of G is also, it's just the smallest subgraph of G, which I can map all of G to. Okay? So if I, if I have some big graph G, maybe I want to sort of, I, I want to sort of uh, simulate that with some smaller subgraph that has all of its homomorphic information of the big graph. So what I want to do is I just want to take G and map it to the smallest possible subgraph I can. And that will be the core of G. Okay, so some properties. So, so are you talking about minimal subgraph or is it, uh, I mean, is core unique? Yeah, okay, so I'm just, I, it's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not by definition, like there's no reason to think, I mean, just on the face of it, it doesn't say anywhere that it's unique or anything, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, I mean, the smallest subgraph, it's unique up to isomorphism, but there may be many copies of that subgraph within your graph. And Okay, so, but it is unique up with isomorphism, and it's not, it's not too hard to show once you sit down and think about it for a little while, uh, but it's certainly not obvious from the definition. Well, when you say smallest, you mean in terms of the number of vertices? Exactly, in terms of the number of vertices, that's correct. Okay, um, uh, so it's not just a subgraph, it's actually always an induced subgraph. And of course, the core of a core is, a, is the graph itself, so if G is a core, well then, I can't map it to any smaller subgraph, so the core of G is G. Uh, and the last thing is that uh, the core of G is complete if and only if the clique number is equal to the chromatic number. So suppose I have, if I have omega G equal to chi of G, and I mean this is going to be equal to some number, C, well Omega of G equal to C, this means that I can map KC into G. And then chi of G equals C means that I can map G to KC, right? So that means that G is homomorphically equivalent to KC. And of course, KC is a core, so it's the core of G. Okay. Also, if this is true, well then, the, this says that the chromatic number is less than or equal to C. And this says that the clique number is greater than or equal to C. But of course, the clique number is smaller, is less than or equal to the chromatic number. So you get that they're equal. All right. Okay, so here's, here's a sort of a non-trivial example. Okay, so here I have the, the five prism graph. So it's just two, two five cycles joined by uh, a matching. Okay, and I'm, I'm mapping it basically just to this inner five cycle. Okay, and here I've, I've just redrawn the first graph, but now in such a way that you can see where everything gets mapped to, right? So I've sort of, I've taken the outside and I've kind of twisted it a little bit. I've twisted it sort of one fifth of a rotation over. Okay, so this red vertex has gone over here and so on. Right, and now you can see that if I were to identify the red vertices and the green vertices and the, so on, I would map it, map it to here. And of course, I can map this back to here because, well, this is just a subgraph, right? So I can just do the inclusion map. All right, so, so I can map this big graph to the five cycle and I can map the five cycle back. So of course, that means that the five, since the five cycle is a core, the five cycle is the core of this graph. All right, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so another thing that we're going to need to talk about are automorphisms of graphs, uh, because the f sort of the first class of graphs we're going to discuss uh, are defined in terms, terms of automorphisms. Okay, an automorphism uh, is just a bijection, so it's a, it's a map from the vertex set of G to the vertex set of G. It needs to be a bijection, and you want it to uh, preserve both adjacency and non-adjacency. So another way of saying it is that uh, phi of U sorry, sigma of u and sigma of v are adjacent if and only if u and v are adjacent. This is exactly what you would expect. I mean, if sort of you're just relabeling all the vertices such that uh, if two, la two things labeled, uh, say, i and j were adjacent, then the new, new things labeled i and j are still adjacent. Okay. And of course, the automorphism group of G is just a set of all of its automorphisms and its uh, a group under just composition of maps.
Okay, and another way of sort of saying what a core is, well, a graph is a core if and only if all of its endomorphisms are automorphisms. So sort of when we originally defined it, we said that it's a core if all of its endomorphisms are bijections. But if I have an endomorphism that's a bijection, it has to be an automorphism. Okay? So a graph is a core if and only if it, all of its endomorphisms are automorphisms. Okay. So the, the first class of graphs that we're going to sort of be interested in um, are what, called, what are called rank 3 graphs. So the reason you call them rank 3 graphs is because uh, the number of orbits on the ordered pairs is 3. Okay? So I take, a, I take some graph and I look at its automorphism group. Now the automorphism group, of course, it's, technically it acts on the vertices of the graph. right? But it induces an action on the ordered pairs of vertices, right? If I have some automorphism sigma, it induces an action by, it takes the ordered pair uv to the ordered pair sigma u sigma v, right? Okay, and then I can think of the orbits on ordered pairs according to this action, right? And if you think about it, well, if u were equal to v, right, then of course sigma of u and sigma of v got to be equal. So I can only map ordered pairs where they're equal to things to other ordered pairs where they're equal. If u, u and v were adjacent, then sigma of u and sigma of v are adjacent. So I can only map uh, things where the two uh, coordinates are adjacent to things where the two coordinates are adjacent. And similarly, if they're distinct and not adjacent, they have to go to distinct and non-adjacent things. So that means, unless you're a complete graph or an empty graph, you have to have at least three orbits on the ordered pairs. Right? So in some sense, this is saying a rank three graph is sort of the, the most symmetric you can get in some sense. OK. So uh, uh, Peter Cameron and Priscilla Kazanidis, they, they were looking at these graphs, and they were studying their endomorphisms. Uh, and what they were noticing is that all of these graphs, they were either cores or the cores were complete graphs. Huh? And then eventually they actually proved that this is always the case. It's not just sort of a coincidence. And uh, I'll give you an idea of the proof. It's actually, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. I mean, you essentially you're just using the symmetry to tell you something about the endomorphism. So, okay, I have, I have some big rank three graph G. All right, so either, either it's got no proper endomorphisms, and then it's a core. Okay, so in, then we're done. So suppose it has some proper endomorphism phi. So I take some proper endomorphism, and I apply it, and I get phi of G. So I map all of, all of G to some smaller subgraph uh, using phi. All right, so since it's a smaller, that means I had to have taken there must be some pair of vertices that go to the same vertex, right? So I have some pair of ver vertices, say u and v. And then there's got to be some vertex here such that phi of u is equal to phi of v, right? So these, these two vertices, they sort of, they get mapped to the same thing by phi, okay? All right, now, if if this image here, if this, is a, if this is a clique, if this is a complete subgraph, then I'm done, right? Because now I've mapped my whole graph to a complete subgraph, which means that uh, that complete subgraph must be the core of my graph, right? Okay, so the only problem is if there's some, there's some vertices in here that are not adjacent, say u prime and v prime, okay? Now, of course, since these got mapped together, they were not adjacent, right? But G is rank 3, right? So that means there's some automorphism of G that maps U prime to U and V prime to V. So I can sort of, I can map these back using some automorphism of G sigma, right? And then what I can do is like, okay, well, then I can just apply phi again, right? And now this U, these, this U prime, V prime, V prime, they'll be identified. 
So I'll sort of get rid of one non-edge in my image. Right? And then I just keep doing that over and over again until I have no non-edges left. Okay? And so that's how you, that's how you prove it. All right, any questions so far? Nope. Okay. So the, the next class of graphs I want to talk about are strongly regular graphs, and this is what my, uh, the result I proved is about. These are sort of our relaxation of, of rank three graphs. Okay, so if I have a graph with, with n vertices, and it's k regular, so that means every vertex has degree k, has k neighbors, uh, then it's strongly regular with parameters n k lambda and mu if any pair of adjacent vertices have lambda common neighbors, and any pair of non-adjacent vertices have mu common neighbors. Right. Uh, and then I'm, I'm, really only, I'm really only concerned with uh, primitive strong regular graphs. So this means a prim it's primitive if it's connected and also its complement is connected. So the complement of a graph, I just take all my edges and re replace them with non-edges, and I take my non-edges and replace them with edges. Right. And actually, for strong irregular graphs, all this does is it just rules out uh, complete multipartite graphs and the disjoint union of complete graphs. Okay? So the, in, the endomorphisms of those of complete, mo uh, complete multipartite uh, graphs and disjoint unions of complete graphs, those are sort of easy to figure out. So we're not really restricting ourselves much here. All right, so probably you already noticed that if you're rank three, then you're strongly regular. Well, that's because any pair of in a rank three graph, any pair of adjacent vertices can get mapped to any other pair of adjacent vertices. So that means they all have to have the same number of common neighbors, right? And the same for the non-adjacent vertices, all right? And this is just an instance of something sort of more general that, that happens a lot of times. So this rank three condition is some sort of symmetry condition. It's, uh, it's a condition on the automorphism group of my graph, okay? But this strongly regular regularity condition is it's sort of a combinatorial condition, right? So we sort of traded our symmetry for something weaker that's just sort of combinatorial regularity. And there are lots of other sort of examples of this. So I mean, I could have, say, a distance transitive graph. This is where I can map any pair of vertices at distance k to any other pair of vertices at distance k for all k, right? And then you can uh, replace that with the notion of distance regularity. And it's not true that if you're strongly regular, then you're rank three. In fact, there are lots of strongly regular graphs that have no automorphisms other than the identity. Okay? So you're really sort of, you're really, uh, it seems like you really pick up a lot more things when you uh, relax to the regularity condition. Okay. So, Kamen and Kazanitis, after they proved the result for rank three graphs, well, they thought that, okay, well, strongly regular graphs, these are basically this is just a combinatorial relaxation of rank three graphs, so maybe the same thing is true, right? So they conjectured, I think they didn't do it in print. I, th I think it's written somewhere in a paper by Chris and Gordon Royal that they tentatively conjectured via private communication that, uh, that uh, the core of a strongly regular graph is either the graph itself or a complete graph. Okay, and then uh, Chris Godsell, who's in the audience, and uh, Gordon Royal, uh, they sort of quickly proved that this is true for uh, certain geometric graphs. So these are strongly regular graphs that are constructed using something called uh, partial geometry. A partial geometry is basically it's a bunch of points and lines that satisfy some nice regularity conditions. I won't go into the ex precise definition, but uh, it's just sort of a nice geometric uh, structure. And using this, you can construct a strongly regular graph. Um, and this is sort of more general than it seems because uh, once you fix the smallest eigenvalue of a strongly regular graph, then all but finitely many are geometric. Okay? So this really proves it for a lot of, a lot of these strongly regular graphs. Okay. Right, and then uh, my result is, uh, is that I, I proved the conjecture of Kazanitis, but I actually proved something uh, a little bit stronger. Uh, so I proved that any endomorphism is either an automorphism or it's a, a map to a complete subgraph, okay? So they just said that sort of 
uh, I, I, the core is either the whole graph or a complete graph, which means that either I have no proper endomorphisms or the minimal image of a proper endomorphism is a complete graph. This says that either you have no proper endomorphisms or you have some, but all of them have a complete graph as the image. So there's sort of no intermediary endomorphisms. All right. Okay, so a rank three graph, like th as I said before, this is a property of the automorphisms of a graph, right? And automorphisms, these are just special cases of endomorphisms. They're just, they're just the bijective endomorphisms. So it's sort of not surprising that if I assume something about the automorphisms, I can prove something about the endomorphisms. Okay? But if I'm just strongly regular, well, this doesn't really tell me anything, not explicitly, about the endomorphisms of a graph. Right? And as you can notice from the proof, I really relied on this symmetry condition. Right? That was really the crux of the proof. That's all I used, basically. Right? So I've basically thrown out the key tool that I, that I used, and now I still want to try and prove the same thing. Uh, and it's, it's not so obvious how you use this regularity the way you might use symmetry. So what, so what can we use? Uh, and it's maybe a little bit surprising, but it turns out that what you want to use is linear algebra. Okay? Uh, it might not have been your first guess. <laughs> Uh, and the reason is that these regularity conditions can actually be expressed in terms of linear algebra, uh, and, uh, which we'll see on the next slide. Okay, so the way we're going to use linear algebra is we're going to define something called the adjacency matrix. Well, it's been defined uh, previously. Uh, so this is just a matrix. Uh, the rows and columns, they're indexed by the vertices of your graph. Uh, and then if I look at the UV entry, well, it's 1 if the U... If ver vertex u and vertex v are adjacent, and otherwise it's zero. Okay? So in particular, like the diagonal is zero. All right? Okay, so here's an example of how a regularity condition can be expressed in terms of linear algebra. All right? So this J matrix, this is the all ones matrix. Okay? So if, I think, if you think about it, what happens when I take my adjacency matrix times the all ones matrix? Well, Every entry is just the inner product of a row of A with the all ones vector, right? So all this is doing is adding up the entries in a row of A, right? So if it's the U row, it's just telling me how many things is U adjacent to, right? Okay. So if it's, if it's K regular, then this is always going to be K, so I'm going to get KJ, right? And if I get KJ, well, then I'm K regular, right? and same for J times A, okay? Okay, so it turns out you can also express strong regularity in terms of linear algebra. So in this case, what you do is you look at the square of your JCC matrix. And if you think about it, well, the UV entry of A squared, this actually tells you the number of paths of links 2 from U to V. All right? Now, I'm strongly regular, so that means that, uh, well, first of all, if u and v are the same. So the number of paths of link 2 from u to itself, I just go to one of its neighbors and come back, right? And there's k neighbors. So I get k times identity. I get all k is on the diagonal. Now, if the two vertices were adjacent, right, then it's strongly regular, so they have lam lambda common neighbors. So, and all the two paths just go to some common neighbor and then to the other one. So I get lambda on the adjacent vertices. And then, if they were non-adjacent, they had mu common neighbors, so I get mu on the non-adjacent vertices. So this A bar, this is the adjacency matrix of the complement. Another way of writing, this is just the all ones matrix minus identity minus A. Okay? All right. So if you're strongly regular, this is true, and if this is true, you're strongly regular. Right? This is basically just the definition, in some sense, of strong regularity, just written in terms of a matrix. It's much clearer than <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> you should do algebraic graph theory then. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you could, okay, I just wanted to rewrite this using I, A, and J. Um, and all you have to do is sort of, uh, I mean, you just have to offset these by mu, since you're having mu here. 
Okay, and what you can see from this is that the poly, all, any polynomial in the adjacency matrix is actually, actually lies in the span of i, a, and j. Okay, so why is that true? Well, a squared, it's obviously in the span of i, a, and j. I just wrote it as a linear combination of i, a, and j. Okay, what about a cubed? Well, I take this times a, and I get a here, right? I get a squared here, which is in the span of i, a, and j. And I get a, j here, but the graph is regular, so this is just a multiple of j, right? So I just get a linear combination of i, a, and j, and so on for any higher power. Okay? So any polynomial a is in the span of these three matrices, which of course is the same as the span of these three matrices. Okay. So suppose we have a strongly regular graph. So I want to let tau be its least, the least eigenvalue of its adjacency matrix. Right? And then I'm going to take e sub tau to be the projection onto this tau eigenspace. Okay? So by projection it means uh, it squares to itself and it's uh, symmetric, right? And the image is the tau eigenspace. Okay, well, since it's a projection of the tau eigenspace of A, A is a symmetric matrix. Any symmetric matrix, you can write the projections onto its eigenspaces as a polynomial in that matrix. Okay? So that means that E tau is a polynomial in A, which means that it's in the span of I, A, and A bar. All right? So I can write it as an inner combination. I don't really care what these coefficients are, actually. Uh, but suffice it to say that they're all different, and alpha is negative, and the other two are positive. It doesn't matter what they actually are equal to. Okay. Now, I want to somehow relate all this algebraic stuff back to homomorphisms, right? So I need to somehow encode the information from my homomorphism into some linear algebra. Okay? And I'm going to do that with this matrix uh, M phi. Okay? And I'm just going to define it entry-wise. So the UV entry of M phi is just going to be the phi of u, phi of v entry of E tau. Right? Now remember, basically the, the UV entry of E tau is just telling me whether u and v are equal, adjacent, or non-adjacent. Right? I can look at that entry and it tells me which one it is. Okay? And, oops, sorry. But the UV entry of M phi, it's telling me how phi of u and phi of v are related. Right? If, it, if this entry is gamma, then I know that phi of u is equal to phi of v. If it's alpha, then phi of u is adjacent to phi of v, and so on. Okay. Now, remember, phi is a homomorphism, so that means it preserves adjacency. So if u is equal to v, of course, phi of u and phi of v are equal. So then these two things are equal. And if u is adjacent to v, well, then phi of u is adjacent to phi of v. Okay. So the only time these two things can be different is if u and v were non-adjacent. Right? And then it tells you whether or not it changes it to adjacent or, or equal. Okay. So if I take my adjacency matrix minus tau times identity times my projection on the tau eigenspace, I get zero, right? Because uh, this is the projection on the tau eigenspace, so its column space is the tau eigenspace. So all of its column vectors are tau eigenvectors. So when I multiply a minus tau i, I get zero. Right? Now you can do a little sort of uh, a linear algebraic trick using the trace to use this to show that this is a, actually zero as well. Okay. And together, I, okay. Now this means if I take the difference of these two things, I'm going to get. I can still multiply by this and get zero. Okay. Well, why should I care about the difference as opposed to just this guy, or just this guy? Well, the practical reason is that this guy has a lot of zeros, <laughs> right? Okay? Remember, these, uh, these two guys, they agree uh, on u equal to v and u adjacent to v, and also on some of the non-adjacent ones as well, perhaps. So this is zero on the diagonal and also all, on all the adjacent uh, entries. That's, that's sort of helpful when I'm going to be doing the, next, uh, the stuff on the next slide. Okay, so why do I care that this product is zero? Right? Okay, this is some nice linear algebraic fact, but at some point I want to pull out some information about this homomorphism. Right? Uh, the overall, overall idea is to sort of, for proving the result, is that I want to assume I have some endomorphism that's not a coloring. 
Uh, and that just means that there's some pair of vertices in the image that are not adjacent. Right? And then assuming that, I want to show that I actually must have an automorphism. All right? So suppose that phi of u and phi of v e are not adjacent. OK, so these don't look super nice, but don't worry about that for a second. So just look at the first line. Now, of course, this matrix product is 0. So if I look at a particular entry, oh, it's 0. It's obvious, right? But now what I can do is I can actually do this multiplication for what this entry should be equal to. Right? I'll, I'll spare you the trouble. And it's, just, it's equal to this coefficient times the size of this set th time, plus this coefficient times the size of this set. OK, so let's think about this first set real quick. OK, so we take all the vertices w that are adjacent to u, all right, and that are not adjacent to v, but phi of, u is, phi of w is equal to phi of v. OK, so if w is adjacent to u and phi of w equals phi of v, well, phi is a homomorphism, so I have that uh, phi, of, phi of u is adjacent to phi of w, right? Because u and w are adjacent, so the images are adjacent. But phi of w is equal to phi of v, but that means phi of v is adjacent to phi of u, right? But I assume that's not the case, right? So actually, there's nothing in this set, right? So this is 0. The size of the set is 0. Oh, but that means this guy's got to be 0, right? OK? So now we got some information. Right? OK, so that means th the size of this set is 0. OK, what is this set? OK, I have, I have a strongly regular graph. I have some vertex v. Right? It's, got some, it's got some neighborhood. And it's strongly regular, so the diameter is 2. So, there's the neighborhood, and then there's the second neighborhood, right? Now, I assume phi of u and phi of v were not adjacent. But of course, that means that u and v were not adjacent as well, OK? So that means u is not over here. u is down here, right? OK, so what's this set? So it's the w that are adjacent to u, but that are not adjacent to v. So it's all the neighbors of u down here. Right? Not the neighbors up here. OK? And this is saying that, OK, if I look at the, if I look at the, the neighbors of u down here, well, the, none of their images are adjacent to the image of v. Right? And also, I know that not, uh, none of the images are equal to v. Right? So the only thing left is that phi of w must be not adjacent to v, to phi of v. OK? So if I have this set up like this picture, this implies that phi of w, w is not adjacent to phi of v. Right? OK, great. Uh, but now I can use the same argument, but instead of on u and v, on w and v. Right? And now I can get the neighbors of w. Right? And phi of these neighbors will also be non adjacent to phi of v. And I can keep going. And actually, it's a result of, of Chris and Gordon Royal and Tony Gardner that this subgraph down here is connected. So that means I can get all of these guys. So I assume that just sort of, I, all I assumed was that my endomorphism phi, it preserved one non-adjacency with v. So I, it preserves the non-adjacency of v with u. Right? But what I get is that actually that implies that it preserves all of the non-adjacencies with v. Right? OK, so that's pretty good. OK, so this is just the picture I have on the board. Right. And then this is the, the claim I just said. So this says, if, uh, if phi of u is not adjacent to phi of v, then actually phi of v is not adjacent to phi of w for anything that's not adjacent to v. Okay? If I preserve one non-adjacency with v, I preserve all non-adjacencies with v. 
OK, so that's basically the whole proof. Here's the outline. Suppose phi is not a coloring. Then there's some u and v such that phi of u is not adjacent to phi of v. OK, well, that means that uh, actually phi of v is not adjacent to phi of w for all of its non-neighbors, right? But now I can apply, I can apply that uh, corollary to the non-neighbors of v, right? They all have one non-adjacency preserved, the one with v. Okay? So I can do it again for all those non-neighbors. Ah, but it's a primitive strong irregular graph, so the complement is connected. Okay? So that means that I preserve all the non-adjacencies. So I preserve adjacency because I'm homomorphism. I preserve non-adjacency by this argument, so I'm an automorphism. Right? And there you go. Okay, so here's, here's sort of the trick. I never really used that it was a, a homomorphism from G to itself. All I really needed is that it was a homomorphism from G to some other strongly regular graph that has the same parameters. And then essentially the exact same argument works. Uh, you just have to slightly redefine this M phi so that instead of, uh, uh, it's, instead of being E sub tau, phi of u, phi of v, it's uh, f sub tau, or f sub tau is the projection of the tau eigenspace of h. Other than that, exact same proof works, okay? And so you get something even stronger. If, I have if phi is homomorphism between any two strongly regular graphs with the same parameters, then it's either an isomorphism or coloring. And actually, you can use the properties of strongly regular graphs to find out that if it is a coloring, then it's a coloring of a very sp of a specific value. It's um, equal to uh, one minus k over tau. All right, and this coloring is optimal for the graph. Okay. All right, so that's that's the main result. Um, and now I want to tell you sort of what really happened. Okay, so I presented the proof in such a way that. Uh, I just used linear algebra. I didn't, didn't use anything sort of super fancy. Uh, but actually, this proof is really related to something known as the, the Lovas theta function of a graph. Um, and this Lovas theta function is this parameter. It's defined by Lovas in 1979. And he used it to prove that the Shannon capacity of the 5 cycle was equal to the square root of 5. So I think this was some open problem for about 20 or so years, um, 20 or 30 years. I can't remember. Um, and he sort of just came up with this parameter that is exactly what you wanted to do, and you can get that uh, the Shannon capacity is, is square root of 5. Okay, and these are just two uh, what are called semi-definite programs. They're dual semi-definite programs that define uh, this, this parameter. This is actually theta of the complement. I just call it theta bar of G. Okay, this should be down here. Okay, so the first one is said, okay, I want to find the minimum value of, some, of a real number t such that I can find a matrix whose diagonals are all t minus 1 and the adjacent entries are minus 1 and the matrix is positively definite. Okay, and it's also equal to this dual program which I want to take the maximum of this sum of b. This is the sum of the entries of my matrix b. Okay, so I take the maximum of that such that the non-adjacent entries are zero. It's got trace one, and it's positively definite. All right. So it turns out what you can show uh, a nice property of these two dual programs is that if I take a feasible solution for the primal and a feasible solution for the dual, and they have objective values p and d, if I take their product and I look at the trace, I get the difference in their objective values. Okay? And this is not hard to prove. If you just write down what this trace is equal to, then you just get exactly this. It's, very, it's like one line. Okay? But what this means is that uh, both of these are optimal if and only if this trace is zero. Right? But since these are positively definite, the trace is zero if and only if actually the, the matrix product is zero. Okay? So you can sort of, you know when uh, to uh, feasible solutions are optimal by just taking their product and seeing if they're zero or not. All right. 
And for strongly regular graphs, we actually have some very nice sort of canonical solutions uh, for these two uh, programs. So for the dual program, what you can do is you can take a minus tau i. And then, you, okay, you need to scale it so it has trace 1. Okay, but a minus tau i, it's positively definite, right? Because I'm taking some matrix and I'm subtracting the min eigenvalue times identity. So this is always positively definite. So it, it satisfies this constraint. I can scale it always so that it has trace 1. And of course, a minus tau i is 0 on the non-adjacencies, non right? So this fe it's feasible here. And then for this, I can just take e tau. And again, I have to scale e tau so that the entries, entries on the edges are minus 1, but I can do that. e tau is a projection, so it's positively definite. Okay? So I have a feasible solution, which is the multiple of e tau here, a feasible solution, which is the multiple of a minus tau i here. Of course, when I multiply those two together, I get 0, right? So that means they have to be both be optimal. Okay? And that's really what we used in this proof. Okay? And this is sort of the more general idea. So you're sort of supposing that you're, suppose you have two graphs that have the same value for this uh, theta bar. And you have some homomorphism between them. Okay, so you take some optimal dual solution for theta bar of g. And then you take an optimal primal solution m for theta bar of, for theta bar of g. You take an optimal primal solution for theta bar of h. Okay. You define n phi just like we defined m phi before. Okay. And then it's not, so it's not, it's not hard to see at all actually that this is going to be an optimal primal solution for theta bar of g. So basically this construction, it preserves positive definiteness. Okay, it preserves the value on edges, so that means, remember the primal solutions, they need to be minus one on the edges, so this preserves that property. Okay, and the, the value on the diagonal is going to be the same as well. Right? So this gives me a, solution, a primal solution for G that has the same value as the primal solution for H here. But I assume they have the same optimal value. Right? So that means that th this will be optimal for G. Okay? But that means that B times N phi is zero. So again, I can take this difference. And again, this difference has lots of zeros, right? right? And sort of the hope is that this tells me something interesting for phi. And sort of the general idea maybe it doesn't look like this always going to happen, but of course, this is exactly what we did, right? So we, b was a minus tau i, up to a scalar, right? m was e tau. n was also e tau because uh, g and h were the same. Okay, and then this was our m, m to the phi, right? And then this is exactly the product we looked at. So this sort of, this is exactly sort of what you needed to prove this result for stronger data graphs, but of course it's a more general idea. So it seems like it could be useful for sort of analyzing homomorphisms in other settings. Maybe you need some conditions on your graph so that you get some nice solutions for these, pri for these primal and dual uh, programs, right? But I mean, if your graph is nice enough or you know explicitly what it is, then uh, Probably you can get something useful out of this. I know I did. All right, that's it.